men and women, as they age, there are uh, changes in fat cell number. Um, one of the interesting things about the fat cells as we age is that we we make almost all of our fat cells during childhood and puberty. And then once we finish puberty, we're done. That number of fat cells in most people, there are some people who are an exception to this, and that's about 15% of people who are in the obese category, but most people reach a limit and that's their fat cell number essentially for adulthood. And then around, uh, as we are getting you know, past adulthood, which of course is beyond 40. So, so I'm just presenting a bigger spectrum of time at the moment. Then we get to our 60s or so, 70s, and then we, the number of fat cells we have starts to decline. It sounds like that's a good thing, but what's, what's happening is if a person is continuing to eat the same way they were before, that grew their fat cells to however big they got, big or small, too much, too full or, or, not, or not, whatever they were, if they, if, if they had fat cells that were big, and now, you know, over full, and now they're starting to lose their fat cell number, that doesn't mean they're losing fat mass. What that does mean is that the fat that was being stored in five fat cells, as you cut off two of them, because they die now and they aren't replaced um, with, with another fat cell, which is what's been happening the whole time before then. One dies every 10 years-ish and another one takes its place. Now you don't have that turnover. And so the fat that was being held in five fat cells, well, now that's only being held in two or three fat cells, meaning those remaining fat cells have had to carry a larger fat burden. And what you're doing is, is putting the fat cell in the perfectly wrong situation, which is forcing fat cells to be over full or what's called hypertrophied or hypertrophic. And a hypertrophic fat cell is a bad fat cell. That's a fat cell that's misbehaving. It's becoming pro-inflammatory and insulin resistant, and then promoting that insulin resistance throughout the rest of the body. So, so lest we look at the decline in fat cell number as a good thing, um, it could be. I do think there's an opportunity there, um, but it would it would involve the aging person to change their diet accordingly to make sure that there is lower energy and lower insulin. That when that fat cell is turned over, well, there was nothing really left in it anyway, or when when it died. And so we're not forcing a remaining fat cell to carry the burden of this fat that 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 this dying fat cell has dropped at its at its feet. So now to bring this back to a woman who's say in her 40s or getting towards menopause, estrogens are um, undeniably a protective effect when it comes to insulin sensitivity and, and overall healthy fat storage. Now, uh, estrogens, that family of hormones that we call estrogens, there's not one single hormone called estrogen, of course, um, they have they play a very interesting role in the in, in fat metabolism, particularly in a woman who has so much more estrogens than a man does. But estrogens are overall protective against too much fat. We know this from animal and human studies. If you remove the ovaries and remove those big, strong estrogen signals, fat mass starts to go up quickly. So there's something protective um, against too much fat mass when it comes to the estrogens in general. And then separate from this is that estrogens actually promote a healthy form of fat storage. By promoting fat storage primarily on the, on the butt and hips of the woman, which is the main site of fat storage for most women, um, that is actually a, a site of fat storage that promotes greater hyperplasia, where rather than having fat cells grow bigger and bigger and bigger, it rather says, all right, you're a little fat cell, you need, there's high insulin, we're telling you to store more. Well, rather than get really big, let's just make a new little fat cell right beside it. And so it might seem like a bit of a paradox, but estrogens essentially help a woman store fat in small, healthy fat cells. Even though there are more fat cells in general, it ends up being an overall healthier profile. And that's why women are almost always fatter than men, but healthier than men at the same time. They're uh, her body is literally supposed to have more fat than the man's, and she needs more fat than the man's to be healthy for normal fertility and, and other processes as well. Uh, and now, in the absence of estrogens, if there's still a signal to be storing fat, more of that relatively is going to be stored like her male counterpart, um, which is going to be more 
central fat storage and hypertrophic fat cells rather than subcutaneous fat storage or the fat storage right beneath the skin and hyperplastic fat cells, which is small but more multiple. So the, the woman transitioning again to maybe put a fine point on it all, she it, it, it is, I think it is still an opportunity to um get lean even i mean as crazy as that may sound I, I don't think i don't think it's hopeless um i think it is an opportunity to to leverage the changes that are happening and maybe even capitalize on those to to be to be leaner than before there might be a benefit to just the steadiness that comes from that transition period where you don't have these really dramatic changes in hormones um you know maybe there's an opportunity um, um, for her to get into habits that aren't um, at the whims of these hormones and the wild changes mm -hmm. that she's had before then. As much as um, this transition period is so often reviled and hated, it is a natural thing. And, and I can't help but think this is how humans have been built. It happens. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for it. It can't all be bad. You know, and maybe that's just an overly naive thing where I'm always determined to see the body as having been built um, as, as a rational series of events. Yeah, so estradiol is the main estrogen that is helping the woman store fat at a limited amount and in a healthier way. And so it is the loss of estradiol that then accounts for the uh, you know, seemingly harmful changes in fat mm -hmm. metabolism. As, as you note, other estrogens are just weaker uh, mm -hmm. and, and they might, uh, I have to speculate, they might have a similar effect and maybe it's just that there's not enough of that signal anymore. Um, or it might be that because that is in fact a different hormone, it might not have the same effect at all. I don't mm -hmm. know. And I never learned this in nursing or my nurse practitioner program. I learned this many years later is that, you know, the, the first two weeks of our menstrual cycles, uh, this is when estrogen, estradiol predominates, and we are much more insulin sensitive mm -hmm. versus the latter part of our menstrual cycle prior to menstruation when progesterone predominates and yep. we are tired and cranky and we become more insulin resistant. And yep. so is it any surprise we get these cravings <laughs> for foods that may or may not be in our best interest to consume, but I love just how the body is trying to, you know, intuitively gravitate towards exactly the way that it needs to work efficiently. I think unfortunately what's happened is that we have these gross abnormalities in our sex hormone balancing, whether it's a byproduct of, or, you know, synthetic contraceptives or, PCOS or infertility or any number, you know, I know in a podcast I listened to yesterday, you were saying the term estrogen dominance isn't really a scientific term um, and seeing a lot of the influence of toxins in our environment, you know, endocrine disrupting chemicals, how a lot of people's yep. hormones, their sex hormones can really get offline. Um, I, I think of that more actually in the context of my children, my little girls and my little boy, especially, I am very mindful of the plastics that we have that they're drinking water from. I'm very mindful of the detergents that we're using and the perhaps the pesticides or other chemicals, many of which remarkably act as estrogens or they have these estrogen mimetic effects. Uh, that is a that's something I'm, I'm very mindful of. I don't want my daughters having too much estrogens. I don't want them to develop physically too early, um, not only because of the social ramifications, uh, but also the genuine health concerns uh, mm -hmm. with increased risks in, in, in breast and, and uterine cancers. And my little boy, of course, I don't want him to be developing in an environment of high estrogen activity. Uh, so this is a result, though, of the world that we live in. There's some, uh, something I can't really speak to because I'm not a chemist, but there, the, the fact that these molecules are so widely used with such a broad application, you know, coming from things like pesticides, detergents, and plastics, those are all three very different things. And yet there are molecules found in all of them that are estrogen mimetics or acting like estrogen is to varying degrees. And that's even more the case when we look at some of the foods we're eating that are increasingly plant-based. And when you are when you are refining a plant, especially a seed, um, in order to say get its proteins, <clears throat> you end up getting a lot of other stuff. 
And, and so I'm very mindful of these other kind of supplements or whatever foods that we have in the home to make sure that not only are we controlling, you know, the plastics and the detergents, for example, but also that my kids, when I'm focusing on them getting protein, which is, which is almost um, my simplest um, strategy for feeding my kids. It is based on real protein. I want it to be protein that's coming from animal sources because I know that they're not going to get, I mean, among the benefits of just getting real fats and real proteins, which will work better, they're not going to be contaminated with these things I don't want, like these, say, phytoestrogens, which have a, a genuine biological effect. You know, when you really look at a lot of the research and, and ironically enough, one of my nurse practitioner journals came recently and the uh, probably the soybean agenda that was being mm -hmm. pushed throughout there. Oh, women in perimenopause and menopause need soy, lots of soy milk, um, lots of lots of edamame, use these soy based products, soy based protein. And so I'm very grateful that unbeknownst to, to you that you kind of touched on this topic because on many levels, I think it all starts with food. I think on every level, the way to ensure that we can properly balance hormones, especially insulin, is based on the food choices that we're making. The you know plant-based agenda, you know the the yep. animal-based proteins versus plant-based proteins. There's little to no comparison between either of oh, them. Oh, that that's right. Yeah, and that that is absolute quantifiable, um, objective data um, by any conceivable metric, animal protein is superior to plant protein, full stop. Um, the, the, the case that some would make that perimenopausal women need to be focusing on soy is absolutely mind-blowing to me, mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. Not only are you going to be getting an inferior source of protein by, again, every metric, and of all the times to start cutting out good protein, that would be the worst to do it, where mm -hmm. you are losing the bone protective effects of the estrogens. You want to do everything you can to keep those bones as, as strong and, and dynamic as possible. And that's what the proteins provide. They turn what would be a hard but brittle structure um, and turns it into a hard and pliable um, structure. So allowing the bone to bend and not break. Uh, so it, it is the worst thing to do to focus on the vastly inferior source of protein that would come from soy. But also there's an honest to goodness clinical case study that I'd seen. I can't cite it off the top of my head, but I know uh, I know it where there was this was a case report of a woman who would experience frequent uterine polyps and bleeding. And, and they scrutinized her diet and found that it was just soy everything. It was soy milk, it was soy, it was tofu, it was soy protein, powder, pro, whatever. And they had her cut all of that out and it stopped. Um, the uterine bleeding stopped, the polyps stopped growing. That's a pretty, pretty damning evidence and uh, against this just ridiculous notion that a woman ought to be focusing on soy. That's that's unethical um, based on the data that suggests it's unhealthy and it's unethical based on the absolute lack of data, clinical data suggesting that it's healthy at all. So we have evidence suggesting it's not, we have a dearth of evidence suggesting that it is. So yeah, it's and that combined with the fact that it is by every metric a worse protein than literally any animal protein, not to mention the beneficial fats that come with that protein, rather than the harmful fats that come with the soy. Well, then uh, to me, the court is out uh, and the decision that a verdict, the verdict is in animal protein all day. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. I think a lot of women are afraid of protein. They're afraid of eating enough protein. Uh, when I start doing, you know, just food diaries with, you know, middle-aged women, I'm, I'm oftentimes shocked that they are eating really tiny, itty bitty portions of protein, far too many carbohydrates. I mean, quinoa is a great example. I think Dr. Gabrielle Lyons said, you know, a six ounces of steak is equates to six cups of quinoa, which if you just take the calorie piece out of the amount of carbohydrates, and we know that we become physiologically more insulin resistant as we age. So yep. the worst thing you can be doing is eating copious amounts of carbohydrates, which is not to suggest that there are, you know, good quality choices of carbohydrates, but certainly in middle age. And I think this also very likely applies to men as well. If we're looking at the average American 88% of individuals mm -hmm. are metabolically unhealthy. Most, if not all of us need to be eating less carbohydrates, more, you know, non-starchy vegetables, 
uh, certainly low glycemic berries if you're doing those kinds of things and less focus on breads and pastas and, you know, these very highly hyper palatable, uh, highly addictive um, processed carbohydrates. That's right. And, and they always come with fat. That's where we are bucking um, nature or and certainly an ancestral way of eating. The diet we have nowadays is high carb, high fat. Those two don't come together. Mm-hmm. It is carbohydrates on their own which is every fruit or vegetable or grain that's almost purely just starch or sugar. And then you have in contrast fat and protein, which Mm -hmm. essentially always come together. Now we have some exceptions where we have gotten oil from, from say some plants or some, from some fruit and fruit oils are fine. That's coconut, avocado, olive. That's a a fat. Those are fats that we've been eating since the beginning of time. Um, but the, other than those exceptions, fat always comes with protein. That's how we should get them. And part of the frustration for me is that when, when people are told to base a diet primarily on carbohydrates, I have two significant um, sources of resentment against that advice. One is that you are now focusing on the macronutrient that spikes insulin the most. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with that. I'm an insulin guy, so of course I do. Two, you are now focusing on the one macronutrient that is not essential to humans. Now, neither you nor I are saying, well, then let's not eat any. We're not saying that. We're more nuanced than that. Yes, you can eat them. You can enjoy them, but eat them in as natural a state as possible. But at the very least, we should say, what is essential in the human diet? There are essential fats. There are essential amino acids. Thankfully, animal proteins have all of those. Let's focus the diet on those two. The fact that they also have little to no effect on insulin, well, that's just icing on the cake. Um, but let's not base the diet on the one macronutrient that is actually not essential to humans. And that's not debatable. Even the most dogmatic dietitian has to admit that um, carbohydrates are not essential to humans. Now, again, none of us are saying let's not eat them at all, but let's certainly appreciate that that is the, that is the, the, the extra stuff. That is the stuff that can be sprinkled around the edge of the plate, whereas the bulk of the plate should be made up of the things we actually have a biological need for, protein and fat. 